can turn sorry, you can turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter two. Titus in chapter two. That's two books before Hebrews for some of the kids. If you find Hebrews, one of the big books in the back, turn left and you'll find it in a few pages. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Uh, the text for the day is verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Let's pray, and then I wanted to give an introduction briefly, and then we'll read the text. I think that's going to be a better way to go. Let's, let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we are gathered together here once more in the name of Christ and under your word, and we ask from you that by your spirit you'd enlighten our hearts to see what's here, uh, that we would be uh, reminded afresh of what you've done for us and the consequences it is supposed to have in our lives, what you've called us to and what you've redeemed us for. Um, help us in this, Lord. Make your word plain and clear, full of power in our lives. Amen. Well, the this text, it starts out with these words, for the grace of God has appeared. And the way I want to present this passage is um, to kind of to use something of a metaphor as I do, and to imagine that there it, you're sitting maybe at a theater watching a play, and there is on stage all of these actors, and then upon that stage appears one bringing the grace of God, and the grace of God has appeared now. Does that make sense? So that envision this as and it's not far-fetched to think of this way. What does Paul mean when he writes, the grace of God has appeared other than upon what we would call the stage of human history, right into our midst has, has suddenly appeared something which wasn't here before, the grace of God. And one person brought it, and certain things flow and follow from the fact that they've showed up with the grace of God. But the way I'm going to cast all that, I think, to make it more visual for you all and more readily accessible, perhaps for the children, but maybe even just more memorable, is to think of yourself in the theater watching this play that's being put on and performed, and some things in a very unexpected way begin to happen as you watch. And, um, and so this is kind of the, the presentation I'm gonna, and the approach I'm gonna take. Um, the actors are all real people, real lives being lived out. It's not just a put on thing, but we're there watching this performance, and it's going very differently than we might have thought. There's some surprising elements. The director of the play is God himself. Okay? Um, 
he has written a script for them. They have thrown the script away and are acting as they will. Um, nothing happens on stage without his approval. He could shut the lights and kill the power and end the play at any time. But he allows it to go on, even though they're acting in ways that he hasn't directed. But as the one who owns the stage and owns the theater and pays the bills and who has the stage hands to work for him, um, all plays end in such a way that meet his approval, right? The acting happening now may not be what he would like, but in the end, it's going to end in such a way that he's going to be happy with the way it ends, satisfied. So this is, that um, sets the stage, I suppose, right, for how we, how we proceed. This is what I mean. All right, so let's read then Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. There's a lot there, but in another sense, it's just basic Christianity 101. And so uh, with that, we'll dive right in and look at these phrases and the words. It says, for the grace of God has appeared. And just this phrase, has appeared, implies a time when it was not so visible, when it was not so evident, not so accessible, not so known, right? It, now, it has now appeared. It, it hadn't appeared, but now it has. All of the time before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the grace of God had not appeared, but now it has appeared. It hadn't appeared, but now it has. That is, Grace may have been known in some ways. It was experienced in measure by some, but it wasn't evident at all how it worked, on what basis it came, how expensive it was. Like, none of those things were really clear. Like, it, you just kind of heard rumblings of grace, and you saw its effect kind of before it came. Like, you might hear a train coming, and you just think, something's coming. I bet it's a train. <laughs> if you've heard them and seen them before. But then suddenly it's here, and it has appeared. And now you finally take the step back, because it's, it's something altogether greater than you realize when you were hearing it come. And this is the way it is with grace. It was never yet revealed how the grace of God was to work, how deeply the well of God's love and grace reached, how exactly the grace of God was to meet our need, that wasn't evident and obvious. Uh, it, wasn't, it hadn't yet appeared with what profound actions God would act on behalf of sinners. We, we, had never, had, we hadn't dreamed that God Himself would give His own Son to die on behalf of sinners. That was truly unexpected, more profound than we would have imagined. This idea that the grace of God has appeared also implies a necessary change in our assessment of the situation. Here we are sitting in our seats, we're watching what's going on, and something appears. The grace of God appears. So here we are watching this play in the auditorium, the scene opens, there are perhaps two people on stage engaged in some activity, some conversation, and suddenly about two minutes in, a third person appears on stage standing between the first two. If you were to see that in a play, immediately your idea of what's happening changes and you begin to assess the situation differently because there's something new, someone new, who has appeared on the stage. The whole thing has changed. We, we expect certain definite changes to take place as a result. We might not know what those changes are going to be. Even if that third person comes in on stage and just sits quietly behind the two, you're building anticipation, something's going to change, it's all different now. You don't know which way this is going to head, but 
it's going to change because some, someone else has appeared on the stage. And this is the way it is with human history. We sit there, things are going all along a certain way, and suddenly Jesus Christ has come and grace has appeared. And if we have eyes to really see what's happening on the stage, we begin to anticipate massive changes, fundamental, important changes, clear distinctions now that grace has come. Paul says that the grace of God has appeared on the stage of human history in just that same way. And we might ask then, now that the grace of God has appeared, what sort of changes has it brought? Right? What sort of changes has it brought? Again, to think of this some other play, you have two people, maybe they're having an argument, a third person comes in, and suddenly someone says, John, what do you think? And now John takes a side. And now it's all fundamentally changed. It's not just two people having an argument, it's two against one now. Right? That kind of thing. It changes. This person, or maybe the person brings with them, these people don't have money, and this guy comes up, and you didn't know it, but he's loaded, and he's got all kinds of money, and now he's brought tremendous change to the situation. What has, when grace appeared, what did it bring? Well, what does it say? What changes? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Bringing salvation for all people. That is, it comes onto the stage as tremendously good news and as a great source of hope and relief and deliverance. It says bringing salvation for all people. So that implies something about the situation on the stage before the grace of God appeared. Namely, it was a desperate one, right? When the grace of God appeared, you had salvation for everyone. Had you, gone to the re had you been in the restroom, had been delayed from seeing the play, up until right before the grace of God appeared, and you walked in, and you didn't even know what was going on, you, couldn't, you didn't see the stage long enough to assess what was happening, and this person came in, and people said, salvation has come. You'd say, well, it must have been bad. Right? You would just know that. If salvation came with this person, it was desperate before they got there. Before the grace of God appeared, the situation was a desperate one. It was a dangerous one, in which every person was in terrible danger of something that they could not escape from on their own, right? Because salvation came with the grace of God. It, salvation wasn't available on the stage before the grace of God appeared, right? So you got all the people in human history, all the ideas and the philosophies and the governments and the powers and everything else, and there's no salvation because great, the grace of God hasn't come yet. They're just powerless. Whatever's going on, it's desperate. It continues to be desperate because there's no salvation. Salvation comes with this one who brings the grace of God. No salvation. No escape from the danger that they're in. Even all together, they had, they had no way to deliver themselves from this danger. The other thing, though, it says bringing salvation for all people. So it appears that anybody that's on the stage can have this salvation. It comes not for just a couple or a select few, but for anybody can have it. The salvation comes, the offer is made, and anyone can get this salvation. The grace of God appeared bringing salvation for all people. It's available to everyone on the stage. But it does more than that. It doesn't just come with an offer of salvation. But what else does it do? Once it gets on the stage, what does it do? Keep reading, verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Training us. That is... It's supposed to create a certain response in the characters on stage as you watch them. Salva grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all. People start to take advantage of that and say, I want that. And they begin to interact with this person who's brought the grace of God. And you find that these people, as they're interacting and dealing with this one who brings the grace of God, they start acting differently. They start 
thinking differently, feeling differently, responding differently. Everything's a little different about them. It's like they're people in, in training. They didn't learn this from place, the people, other people on the stage. No one had taught them this. This is something that has been trained. Who's doing the training? This one who brings the grace of God. They are to be affected and taught and trained in ways they had not been acting before. So this grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people and also training them. To what end? What's, how is it training them? Well, first of all, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. To renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. They are to renounce, or you might say, if you don't know that word, to reject or to forsake, to no longer walk and talk in the ways that they used to. They're going to renounce those things and give them up, forsake them. They are to reject, what is it? Ungodliness and worldly passions. That is to say, the characters on the stage until now have all been acting in ways that are ungodly. They've not been a group of people who are devoted to God, or who think of God, or who act in the interests of God. They've perhaps often mocked Him, or even the idea of His existence. They've put Him far from their thoughts. Instead, they've been living for the satisfactions of their worldly passions, right? Things like food and drink, wealth and riches, the esteem and admiration of others, the love of ease and rest and comfort, sexual desires, the thrill of adventure, the gratification of pride, the love of self. They've been living for those things, worldly passions. That's how they've been living and acting there on the stage. Now imagine yourself for a moment sitting there in the audience and you watch this play being performed and you see the kinds of things that are being done on the stage. It's a pretty grotesque, a pretty evil scene on the stage before the grace of God appeared. You might have said, I would have walked out long ago, but I was strapped into the seat. I didn't want to see any of this stuff. But that's how all are living. The people on the stage were performing all sorts of evil deeds. It was the sort of scene that would have made you scream and yell to make it stop. Right? But it wouldn't stop. It just keeps going on and on. And as you continue to witness this, since it is all on a stage and in front of you, you realize, because everything can be seen, nobody's hidden on the stage, that you realize that every person on the stage is deeply involved in the evil. Some are maybe louder than others. Some are doing it right center stage. Some are kind of more back in the corner. But you see that everyone is involved in these sorts of evil things. Some of them think they're less, some of them are so bad that some people on stage are, are disgusted by other people on stage, they want nothing to do with them. But even the people that think they're great are terribly evil, participating in the same sort of ungodliness and living for the same worldly passions, just fulfilling them in different ways. Some of them prefer to do their evil, sinning in a way that's less visible and rowdy than the others, but again, as I said, they're still on the stage, and you are witness to all that they do. So here you are watching, and you pretty quickly realize that if God, if the director, if God were to, you've been to, maybe you've been to these plays before, and this isn't the way they're supposed to go, that if God were to show up onto this stage, it's going to go badly for everyone here, really badly. From deep within you, all of your soul cries out for someone to put an end to the senseless amounts of evil being performed by these people on stage. It is an outrage. And then finally, when you can stand it no more, it finally happens. God appears. He shows up. And you're, and you're, you're ready. Here it comes. It's going to finally end. But surprisingly, he's not come to judge and he's not come to put an end to everything that's happening, at least not yet. Instead, it is the grace and the kindness of God that has appeared. He showed up 
it seemed like surely now, it's gone on long enough, he will make an end to it all. But instead, he shows up with grace. With grace. Bringing salvation for all these people. Offering it to all. You can all, I know what you deserve, but you can be freed from that, and you can live another way. You can be saved from your miserable, miserable self and your miserable fate. He offers this to all of them. He's, the grace of God has appeared and brought with it a way for people to be saved from the punishment and the fate that they rightly deserve. And not only may they be saved, but if they understand what is happening, it's not just you can escape the punishment, but if, you under, if they understand what's being offered them, and you witness this in some of them as you watch, their hearts are melted and their minds are changed, and their lives begin to take a new and a different path. They forsake their old ways. They're not acting on the stage the same way that they were because they've been stopped in their tracks by the appearance of the grace of God. It had immediate consequences for them. They're almost stunned and shocked right out of their old activity. And now, they're on the, now here they are on the stage thinking about what they have witnessed in this grace of God. And as they think more and more about it, they are more and more deeply convinced that they have to abandon all their old ways of living and all the ways they used to interact with the other actors on stage. They must instead be someone who is godly and must center their lives around him. And they pick up that script that he wrote again and begin to act according to his script. What does he say? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and then positively and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. They now realize just how awful their former way of life was been, has been. The more they think about and examine this grace of God, the more they interact with the one who brought it, the more they learn the importance of self-control, and the more they're able to practice self-control, even while on the stage with others who are still acting in those evil ways. It's not just that they were distracted for momentarily by the grace of God and kind of thought about that and then went on back to doing their thing. They fundamentally changed. Like they, When the grace of God appeared, it not only brought a change in the situation, but a change in them. And now they're on the stage with the same people doing the same sorts of evil things, but they're not doing those things. Those people are living for worldly passions, but, but these who have, who have responded to the grace of God are practicing self-control. These others are living in an ungodly way, but this person is consumed with God. Right in the midst, on the same stage, in the same place, you're watching it all. There it is happening. But they're not exercising self-control just as it relates to merely to worldly success and being you know, disciplined, but rather as it relates to righteousness and to a godly life. These people who have understood what the grace of God is and who have noticed and responded to its appearing all have the same response. It's like some people back there, some people up center stage, some people off on this side, some people on the front. All different places, but they're all responding in the same way. They abandon their former manner of life and then even though they're still rubbing shoulders with these others on stage who are doing evil things, even though the others have not put away their games of sin and all the props that they're using for their wicked lifestyle, their wicked acting, these other people who have responded to the grace of God have begun right in the midst of that to live for God and to walk in a righteous way. Notice it says, the grace of God trains us to live this new life. What's the last phrase, uh, turn of phrase in verse 12? In the present age. Right? In the present age, in the midst. Of the grace of God has appeared here now in this present age and training us to live this certain way in this age. Right? Here and now, not once the play is over, once the judgment comes, then we can get on with living this way, but now. And this is what happens. They don't wait for the next act or go on as they are, as they are just living this way until intermission and then kind of sort it out then. 
right there in the middle of the act as you're watching it, they fundamentally change what's going on. And they are not, whatever was happening on the stage before, they're not with it anymore. They're not with that program. They're acting in a totally different way. It's very obvious that they're reading from a different script now than everyone else on stage. They do an about face and no longer perform according to the script that the rest were reading from. Instead, they're responding to the grace of God which has appeared. They've returned to the director's script. What else does it say? Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what else, you, what else you notice happening on stage with these people is you see these ones responding to the grace of God that has appeared and acting differently and, and forsaking their old manner of life. You begin to kind of really pay attention. Maybe you're too far back and you see an empty seat and you come up a couple rows and you can hear now a little better what's happening and, and examine their lives more closely. And what you find is the same people who have responded in such a striking way to the appearance of the grace of God those same ones all appear to be in some new and different sort of training than the rest. They're all whispering to themselves the same sorts of things as they go about living their new lives and under this new training. And you're trying to hear what they're whispering. And one of them comes close enough and you can hear, you catch what they're whispering. They're whispering about a hope that they have for the future. They're, they're going about their business kind of Reminding themselves and talking about this hope that they have. And they're talking about another appearance of God on the stage. One who's going to, an appearance of God that's still yet to come. It's the one that you thought was going to come originally. When God's going to end all the madness on the stage and get rid of all these actors and put them to shame and finally end all that. Of course, you know and feel that when God shows up this time, He will do what you expected He was going to do last time. He's going to do what so desperately needs to be done, to put an end to the evil on the stage. That sounds like a fearful and a terrifying thing, and it surely will be. But these people who have responded and who are in training are unafraid. They're even happily reminding themselves of its coming. In fact, they have great hope in that future day. They call it a blessed hope. <coughs> in Hebrews, we read about people who have a knowledge of the of the grace of God, and then go, turn away from that and go on sinning willfully, it says what remains for them is a fearful expectation of judgment. And that's kind of what we're watching and expecting. We have this fearful expectation of the judgment that's going to come upon the scene. But these ones who have responded to the grace of God are saying, oh, he's going to come again. And we're saying, I know, it's going to be terrifying. And they say, oh, my blessed hope. Confident expectation of good things coming to them. At this day, they're happily reminding themselves of its coming. Why? Because, of <coughs> because God is the one who has saved them from the terrible fate and the judgment that surely is waiting for everyone who was on that stage doing those evil things. That's why. They know they're guilty, just as the others. But they also know that they have a Savior. They're waiting for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's gonna, he appeared once. He's going to appear again. And yes, He's going to judge. Because He is a judge. But He's my Savior. And He's going to come. And I can't wait. That the one who will do the judging on that day is the same one who has assured them that they're safe from that judgment. And that their sins have been forgiven them because the penalty for their sins has already been carried out on the Son of God. They're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, and it keeps going, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify us for Himself, I'm sorry, and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. The one who came bringing the grace of God, namely Jesus Christ, brought it in a certain way, 
with a certain goal in mind. He didn't just walk up on stage and say, salvation, anybody wants it. There's something that happened, and maybe you were distracted and you missed it, but now you're hearing it described as to what happened on that stage. Jesus Christ did this, we're told. He gave himself for us to redeem us. He purchased us. There was a purchase that was made. Just like you might take an item to a pawn shop to get some money for a short-term need, once you're in a better spot financially, you may seek to buy back the item that you had pawned with money. Right? When you do that, you're redeeming it. You're buying it back, buying it out of hock, buying it from uh, out of the store and off of the merchandise shelf. You're redeeming it out of the situation it's in. You, don't, you say, that's mine. I don't want you to, that's not for sale for, for anybody else to buy. That belongs to me. I'm going to buy it back. It's mine, and I've got it back now. You've redeemed it. It says, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us. Right? When Jesus Christ came, bringing the grace of God with him, he did it. The way he brought the grace of God to us was by paying a price to redeem us out of what we were currently living in and out of what we were currently living for. He was not willing that we should continue in that sort of a life. He knows that we were not made for that, but for something far better. But in order to deliver us from that, there was a price to be paid. Right? He sees all this going on. He witnesses what you're witnessing on the stage. He comes down, and before he judges them all, he comes up on the stage and says, I'm going to give my own life away in order to make an offer for you to be saved and to escape from the filth that you're living in and living for. Why does he have to pay a price? Well, the, the people on the stage are not free people. They can't be interfered with. They can't just go down there and, and uh, keep them from sinning in this way, change things. There is a script that they're following. It's not God's script, but they're living according to their evil desires, and they're full of sin. But because this is on God's stage, whatever they've written on their script, at the, maybe they don't realize what's written on the last page. At the end of the script, God shows up to make sure that justice is done upon them all. And that's the play. And so it's not possible to just release the people on stage from the justice they deserve. Because every play in this auditorium ends in a way that God is satisfied. And if the people have, have gone on on stage acting in ways that that don't fit with what was written for them to do. Well, then everything changes, and now what happens? Now the ending is going to have to be different, and the ending is that they will suffer for an eternity in hell. Judgment will come. And that's necessary that that happens. It can't just end in a way that everybody just, you know, is forgiven and just pat on the back, and what a great performance that was, and we all go home happy to see what we saw. It's a terrible thing that's happened up there. No play may end without God's sense of justice being satisfied. And so it's not possible to just release any of these people on stage from the justice they deserve. The penalty must fall on someone for the outrage that has been happening on the stage. And that's what Jesus Christ did, right? He gave himself as a ransom, as the price of redemption, in order to deliver them from all of their lawlessness, saving them from the penalty that they deserved. We often think of the salvation offered us by God as something which is set to free us from the condemnation of sin. And that's not really the case. That's what, the, because we were condemned to die as sinners, it was necessary that a price be paid in order to rescue us. But get it or to rescue us from the consequences of our sin in terms of judgment. But the actual act of getting us to stop living that way, to stop being the kind of people who act on stage in that way is something different. But is just as much a part of salvation as anything else. Jesus Christ redeemed us from all that lawlessness. There we were on, on the stage with all those 
lawless people, the wicked people. We were one of them, and he wanted us out of that into something else. Right? Just like, again, you go to that pawn shop and you find that thing that you pawned in, and now you have enough money to get it, and there it is on the shelf. You say, that doesn't belong there. For anyone to take home, that's mine. I'm going to buy it back, and you take it, because you don't want it there. You had another purpose for it. And this is the way God sees people and souls. They don't, they don't belong. They didn't make them for that. That's not what they're for, for that lawlessness. And he pays, this, he pays the price necessary, and he grabs hold of them, and he takes them off the shelf, out of their sin, for something else. He redeemed us from all lawlessness, right? And to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That's the purpose. So he takes them out of that lawlessness and he begins to enact a process in their life. He begins to purify them for himself. As they are, I mean, the pawn shop owner didn't take care of it. It's dusty, it's dirty, it's moldy, it's gross. It's going to take some work. If this is going to go into the master's house, this is going to take a lot of work. And he begins to work on it and to purify it. Another term for that, you go undergo training, right? You start your training. That's what this is. Here he is, right? It's training us, it's training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. That's what the grace of God does. It trains us for that. Or here, in verse 14, it's described as, He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. That is, He purchased us out of lawlessness and wants to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. A people for His own possession who are zealous for for good works. That's the end goal. That's his, what's his purpose in this? To redeem for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The script he had written that they were supposed to act out on stage, you might say this way, was one of one act of kindness and generosity motivated by an appreciation for God after another. It was wonderful. It's the kind of thing that you would walk out saying, I've never seen such acts of love and sacrifice and kindness performed as were performed there. And it just went on and on and on for eternity. It just kept going. This was the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. They would do anything for one another and for God. Such was their love. I've never seen anything like it. But instead of that, what happened? The people were living ungodly lives, living for worldly passions. And so God has come to take those people, and in the, while they're still on the stage, He doesn't take them off the stage. He leaves them there. That's the thing. We're talking about taking somebody off the, something off the shelf and taking it somewhere else. But God leaves us there on the stage and cleans us up on the stage and puts us in training on, while we're still on the stage to purify us for Himself while we're still on the stage, that we would live a certain way, a new way, while we're still on the stage. And the kind of people we're to be are zealous for good works. So there in the midst of all this other stuff that's going on, there are certain people who are not just kind of doing good works and then they get shouted down and they quiet down. They are zealous for good works. They stand out. In the midst of that darkness, they're like bright lights, right? As Jesus says, He's set them up. He, once they're, they're, they're His, once, once they've been, they're starting to be, they're undergo training, He's moved them into various places that light would shine in all the dark spots. This is what happens. The grace of God has appeared and everything's changed. There's still all kinds of wickedness going on, but the whole flavor of what's happening on stage is totally different. Some people are being saved from this mess. Confident, eager for when God appears again. They're acting differently. They're doing different things than everyone else. 
But as you look out on it, even though there's so much filth that's going on and that can grieve you still, there's so much to be encouraged with because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all men. But this was God's goal and His aim in mind, to purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous for good works. Now there's a larger goal in mind and aim and purpose that He has once He comes again. He has a larger purpose for that grace of God that appeared. But for now, in the here and now, what he's after is people who are zealous for good works. So if we were to see all that and kind of say, okay, well, in conclusion, what? What's the, what's the you know, what do we, okay, if that's true, then what? We'll just look at verse 11 again. Four. <laughs> Four. In other words, Verses 11 through 14 are the foundation for what came before, right? Four is just that word because, right? If I say to the kids, you guys need to go to bed early. Why? Because we've got to get up early in the morning. So the reason you're going to act a certain way now is because there's this other reason, right? And say, I want you to go to bed early tonight for you're going to have to rise early in the morning, Right? It's that kind of thing. Well, here, Paul has been saying some things that we've not, been look, we've not looked at them yet in Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And he's been giving commands, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, because the grace of God has appeared. So take that whole scene we've just witnessed and all that we've been talking about. Because that actually happened, and God's purpose is that these people would be zealous for good works, what is all that? What's there for what? If, if these things are true, this is the be, because of these things, what? What should we do? Verse 1 As for you, as for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And here's, he just begins to instruct in general the things Titus is to pass on. Older men are to be sober minded, dignified, self controlled, sound in faith in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, Urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. They're to act in these ways so that the doctrine of God, the teaching of God, the salvation that He's appeared would be well spoken of by outsiders, admired, above reproach in the world. Why? Because the grace of God appeared for that purpose, to redeem us from all those, man, all those man, kinds of sins and to make us godly and zealous for good works. It's supposed to produce those ki that kind of people. Verse 15, declare these things, these commandments and the ways of living I've commanded you, and exhort and rebuke with all authority. It would be one thing to say, Declare these things, make them known that the people, Christians should be living this way, and exhort them, encourage them to live this way. It's quite another to say, and rebuke with all authority. Those are, that's a step farther. It's not just something we, a goal we have, something we aspire to. Our failings on this point are to be rebuked with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Right? So how, do, how does that work? That, so, there's, so here, 
kind of now you take your place, you're, now you realize, wait a minute, I'm on the stage too. <laughs> Suddenly, you're part of this thing, right? And someone comes to you and says, brother, sister, you're not living in this way. And you say, oh, come on, it's not a big deal. But you, were, you didn't know you were talking to Titus, and he heard from Paul, and Paul says, don't disregard, and so Titus looks at you and says, don't disregard me. Have you forgotten what the grace of God appeared? That when it appeared, what it appeared for? What God's purpose was? Don't you know? You see how it is. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. You need, some, you need to be reminded of these things. To be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling. To be gentle. To show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish and disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, right, when the grace of God appeared, He saved us. And it wasn't because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. He washed us by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, right, that the work on the cross, when that appeared, being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Right? I want you to insist on these things. Insist on the kinds of lives that I've commanded that people are to live. Why? Because, or so that, those who have believed in God would be careful to devote themselves to good works. Why does it matter that the people who have believed on God are careful to devote themselves to good works? Because the reason Christ gave His life was to redeem you out of lawlessness, to make you His own possession, that you would be zealous for good works. So it really matters that you be someone who devotes yourself to good works. Because He died that He would have a people who are zealous for good works. And if that's not you, you're not His. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and dissensions and quarrels about the law, for they're unprofitable and worthless. There are people who take this knowledge of the grace of God, they hear it, they receive it, they learn about it, they go through a little training, and then it's not long, and they seem to get distracted by these other things, minor points, insignificant things compared to the main thing. And they begin to do what? They have these controversies. And Paul says they're just foolish, these debating on genealogies and various dissensions and quarrels about the law, for these things are unprofitable, they're worthless. And as for such a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he's self-condemned. So, that's the conclusion. That's the so what. If these things happened, if the grace of God did in fact appear, it brought salvation for anybody, it... it when you do respond to it, it puts you in training and to renounce ungodliness, to renounce worldly passions. You're supposed to live instead, you're trained to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life, even in this present age, while you're waiting for the appearing of God to come again, knowing that the one who's going to appear is the one who gave him his own life for you to purchase you out of your former manner of living and to bring you into something good and pure and holy instead, to, put, to make you zealous in that new life. How do you respond to that? You respond by being devoted to good works. You respond by preaching the gospel. You respond by keeping the gospel the main thing and not giving yourself, letting yourself be distracted by other things and quarreling and causing dissension about minor things. You give yourself to these things. You give your life for the same purposes that Christ gave His life. That's what you do.
Well, that's all I have for today. <laughs> Are there questions or comments? Further discussion? Anything on this point? Pretty simple. Like I said, Christianity 101. But how easily forgotten. I mean, here Paul is writing these things. You would... You wouldn't be surprised if Paul had to write these things to a person who'd been a Christian for a year or was a brand new convert or who hadn't been around much teaching, but it's Titus. Like he'd been his faithful companion for years. He sends him off. He's the one he's, he, he, he trusts him out here out on Crete to, to establish a church. And he's, he doesn't leave these things to chance. He says, look, there's, there's one main goal you've got to have here. And it's people who are living lives of godliness in the knowledge of the grace of God. That's what we need. People who know the gospel and are zealous for good works. And don't let anything else take away from that. Establish the church in these things. Don't allow people to disregard you. Don't allow these things to be pushed aside. Keep these things front and center. This matters. This is why Christ died. Very simple. Very basic, but very necessary. Absolutely essential. And easily left undone. Right? We're easily distracted, easily pulled away, easily given to other things. That's not safe. All right. Well, why don't we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, again we come and ask that you would take your word and do in us, with it, all that it was meant to do. We want to be those on the stage who respond well and right, and those that shine bright and work hard. and join ourselves to the cause of Christ in the world. Help us, Lord, to enter in more fully to these things. Not to be one who served you with a half heart. You're certainly worthy of of all we can give and then more. We ask for grace. We know that in one sense, as the text talks about here, grace has appeared, but there's also this washing and renewal of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and that's, we need that all the time, this work of the Holy Spirit within to empower us, to convict us, to help us, strengthen us. To take your word and quicken it to us. To minister one to another and encourage and exhort each other, reprove one another as is necessary to bear one another's burdens. Help us, Lord, as a church to enter into this fully, the things we've seen today. We ask all this certainly in in the name of Christ and in your own holy name. Amen.